Hey, this is Steve from Tabletop Inventing. This talk, Educating Makers, the First Step to Revolutionary Change, was presented at the Inside 3D Printing Conference in New York City, April 3rd, 2014. Unfortunately, at that time, I was unable to capture the audio, and thanks to Ben Roberts from ModFab in Australia, uh, we do have an audio recording, but it picks up several slides in, so I'm going to do my best to uh, pick that up until then. What do the Mars Curiosity rover, vegan strawberry shortcake, and 3D printing have in common? If you answered they can all be 3D printed, uh, you would be correct, and at the conference someone actually said that, and I should have expected that uh, when they said that, but we were actually fishing for a, a different answer. And the answer we were fishing for was that each of these things requires creative thinking and experimentation when starting from scratch. The Mars rover, for instance, went through a significant process of innovation before it ended up on Mars. It didn't just come straight off of uh, a sketch pad onto the launch pad and then get shot off to Mars. Engineers spent a long time innovating and working hard in teams to uh, get the optical systems running, to get the, uh, the drive systems running, and my favorite, the, the levitation systems, as they were uh, dropping this thing in the last few m meters onto Mars. I mean, the innovation that was required for this, uh, this little device, you know, that was shot, you know, across our solar system, was amazing. But the process took a lot of iteration and a lot of deep thinking and uh, creative thinking. Now, s vegan strawberry shortcake doesn't sound particularly complicated. It sounds like something you could just drive down to your local uh, boutique uh, cafe somewhere and pick up a piece. And that might be true. But if you like to cook, you'll know that that creamy uh, filling and that uh, luscious cream on top in this particular photo typically come from a dairy product of some sort milk, cream, eggs. If you're making a vegan strawberry shortcake this is going to require a different process. It's going to require a lot of experimentation. It's going to require a lot more creativity. You're probably not going to get it right the first time but by thinking creatively and continuing to work at this problem, you will eventually come up with a fantastic recipe if you're good at cooking. And it is this process precisely that we are interested in investigating. So we're going to talk about education in this talk, specifically about a topic called maker education. Now when I started my career as, uh, as a teacher in college, uh, I took lots of education classes, but I discovered along the way that I wasn't as good of a I wasn't as good a teacher as I thought I was going to be, and fortunately for the students who never had to be subjected to my early classes, I decided instead to get a Ph.D. from Case Western Reserve in physics, and then go on to uh, work at NAVAIR, a branch of the Navy, uh, as a civilian researcher looking at uh, laser systems. Now this is the point at which in the audio. Uh, Ben's audio picks up, so we're going to take a transition here momentarily. Um, I need a volunteer. Oh, are you volunteering? Yeah, I'm volunteering. All right. Um, normally, I do much more interactive things. Can you make sure everyone gets one of these? I'm not used to the stage on the stage. I don't like standing up in front of people and pretending like I know everything, because I don't, right? Uh, the more you go into education, the deeper you look, the more you know you don't know. And normally, with the classes that we do, because I'm a reluctant teacher, I had to come back to this. And I went through this whole weird career thing and ended up back in teaching. And it's largely my wife's fault. She's a, she's a natural teacher. She was the one that lined up the teddy bears on the bed, took pictures of them, and taught them and stuff. Hey, I didn't do that. Okay, I was out building catapults, and you know, I had a lab in the, bed, in the closet under the stairs. You know, I mean, nothing ever worked, and you know, in the beginning. But eventually, they, you know, 
maybe in college they started to work, my ideas. But I'm a maker. I've always been a maker. And so you're getting something in your hands that's the process of iterative thinking. And if you have earphones and you stick them in your pocket and you pull them back out a couple of hours later, everybody knows it's the impossible knot. You have to be a mathematician to solve the knot theory to get that thing untied. This little thing I'm handing out uh, is kind of a minimalist solution for keeping that from happening. And uh, we always use this as, a, as a, a discussion point when we start a lot of our classes with teachers or with students to the process of how did this come to be? Because as you look at it, you'll open it up, and, and if you're not opening it up, you're go ahead and fill it, it's okay. I give it to you because I need you to do something with your hands so that you don't focus on the mistakes that you make. Um, it is, it did not spring out of my head like this, right? That's about design rev seven or eight, right? And and I I made a lot of design revs early on, and then we left it that way for a while. And then recently, I something jumped in my head. And I said, we can make it better. And I made another design rev. And this is just a little thing that we give out to teachers and students because it illustrates the points for, that we think are important. All right, I'm spending way too long on that. Uh, how many of you are familiar with STEM? You know what STEM is? Okay, I'm preaching the choir. All right, so uh, for the three who don't know what that is, uh, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, that's going to come up a couple of times. But it's not necessarily connected to the next point. Which is that my wife and I were uh, visiting friends in Seattle, and uh, as what happened, we started having a conversation about education. And we were sitting uh, on the Puget Sound, uh, looking out at the boats and talking about uh, education. And then the conversation took a negative turn. I, I have to admit, uh, occasionally I like to blame things on the government. And so I fit into the other 80% sometimes. You know, only 20% of Americans currently trust their government in Washington. And you know, this, this negative thought led to you know, other negative discussions. You know, I mean, education is in a deplorable state. We all kind of know that. Teachers know that. And we don't like it that this is the case. And so we were complaining and wondering how do we do this. And of course, you know, then, then you ask, well, how are, you know, with that kind of a, 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 a literacy rate, I mean, how are we going to face this? How do we deal with that? What are we going to do? And it was at this point, you know, and I was, you know, just asking my wife these questions. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? And then I made a mistake, because my wife is a smart person. And I made a pontifical judgment on Washington, and I said, you know, if we just replaced all the photos of Washington, and just put some new blood in there, that will solve our problems. And she looked at me and she said, where did they come from? We educated them in our schools. We voted them in. They, they have our values because we check before we vote before. They came from our communities. We made this problem happen. Well, that stopped me in my tracks. I'm oh, reeling like someone took a big left hook. <laughs> that was a major shift in my thinking about, well, you know, okay, I can't blame it on Washington now. That, that's kind of my fault. Oh, no. Uh, here comes the personal responsibility. Because I have a confession. I vote, therefore I contributed to the political problems in our country. Uh, I buy things, so I'm contributing to the financial problems in our country at some level. Uh, I use water and food and technology, therefore I contribute to the global challenges to, to supply these sort of things. And so, I began thinking about this, and I'm going to read you something here because this is a quote and I don't want to get it wrong. Let's see. There we go. I was listening not too long ago, and someone said this amazing quote. This is from... Uh, 
tombstone, curiously enough, the Westminster Abbey. And there was a gentleman in the sunset of his life. And he was reflecting back, and on the tombstone it says, When I was young and free, and my imagination had no limits, I dreamed of changing the world. As I grew older and wiser, I discovered that the world would not change. So I shortened my sights somewhat and decided to change only my country. But it too seemed immovable. As I grew into my twilight years in one last desperate attempt, I settled for changing only my family, those closest to me. But alas, they would have none of it. And now I realize as I lie in my deathbed, if I had only changed myself first, then by example I might have changed my family. From their inspiration and encouragement, I would then have been able to better my country. And who knows, I might even have changed the world. These changes are not going to happen just by trying to change things at the top. That's not where the changes happen. Okay? They change right here with us. They change with the schools, which is why we do what we do. And if you are wondering why we are so uh, single-minded about changing teens and how they think, it's because we believe that by changing teens and how they think, how they question, that that will change the world. So here's an equation for you. Um, teenagers plus inspiration plus better questions equals revolutionary change. And I'm going to spend most of the time talking about those three things. And inspiration has a couple of things in it. We'll see if you can catch that later. But let's focus for a minute on better questions. Why are better questions important? So, surface questions are just the first thing that pops into your head. And if you start looking at something with surface questions, you'll find that as you go a little deeper, that there's more. And that the first questions you ask weren't quite good enough. So if you ask deeper questions, you start to find core issues. You start to find things that, that, that are really influencing the landscape. These aren't just uh, peripheral things. These are things that are really driving the system. And very often you'll find as you go deeper and deeper into a problem that there is some sort of central issue. And it is the one thing, and it might be small, it might be sitting off the corner, you might not have noticed it before, but it is the it is the cap, the keystone, the thing at the center that if you take care of it, the problems go away. So let's Think about a couple of examples of asking good questions. This happens to be an apple tree and happens to be, well, claimed to be the famous apple tree that Isaac Newton was observing when he came up with his idea about, I, with the question, mind you, why did the apple fall from the tree? So that's, that's the question. Why did the apple fall from the tree? Well, that question will naturally lead, naturally lead you to look for some sort of a force that caused that to happen. And Isaac Newton then began to look deeper into this, and he found that indeed there's some sort of gravitational pull. He did some really careful experiments beyond apples and other things, and he found that gravitation is a result of two masses attracting to each other, and I could bore you with the physics of that, you know, since we're in for a square law, blah, blah, blah. But the big underlying idea is two things with mass attract. Now it turns out that that is not the deepest way to think about this. There's another gentleman by the name of Albert Einstein who asked a different question. He asked, well, what is it about those two things that causes them to attract in the first place? Not an underlying force, but 
Is there something deeper there? And as he probed into this, he found that there's more to it. It isn't just the mass, but the energy is also related to mass. And all these things bend space. And the, when time is coupled to space, that space bends. And that's a result of the gravity of, of mass of these objects. And that's what we observe as gravity. So if you took a marble on this sheet, you imagine the Earth there is having a mass, you put a marble around there, you'll see it's going to roll down to the middle. That's kind of the idea of mass bending space. It turns out, though, that there's some other interesting things that can happen. Light is a form of energy, and it turns out that light also is attractive. If you draw a line across there and it goes near the Earth, it'll curve a little bit as it passes the Earth because of the gravity. And it turns out the sun it has a pretty high mass. And you can actually see the sun like a magnifying glass. You can actually see things behind the sun by just using the gravitational field of the sun. And I don't know, I'm a physicist, I get really geeked out by this, and I think that's like super cool. But that happened because Isaac Einstein, or Albert Einstein, asked a deeper question. He asked another question to try to get closer to the core issues. So asking better questions is a very important part of the educational process. And we believe that you can inspire better questions through this idea of maker education. If you're not a maker, don't worry. You can become a maker. It's really easy. You, know, you just have to start making things. And when you start making things, um, some very cool things happen. Now, I'm going to throw out a little bit of educational philosophy. Maker education is a hands-on philosophy of learning in which physically building solutions leads to deeper thinking. Now, it turns out that we could probably use a, a more educational definition. Um, we might say maker education is a constructionist philosophy of learning in which students are presented with projects and challenges requiring them, requiring them to build physical solutions to a problem which has been leveraged as a rich opportunity to simultaneously introduce concepts as well as to motivate the need to learn those concepts. Now, I like this version of better because it, that one's easier to and so that's why I put that one up there. But the basic idea is you learn best by doing something. You don't learn by just trying to cram the knowledge and it just doesn't work. In fact, uh, it'd be nice if we could hook our kids up like this. I have kids. If we could hook our kids up like this and just dump it in, that would be a lot easier. Right? If we just wired in. It'd be nice if we just said something and they would just learn, right? I mean, just, could you please pick your stuff up off the floor? Could you please answer, you know, blank there? Would you please? Um, but that's not how it is. That, that's not how learning really happens. How learning really happens is you have a learner and you have a mentor. Because I can't physically put anything into your mind. I can't do it. Okay? I can't rewire the neurons in your head. You are the only one that can rewire the neurons in your head. So all I can do is present some sort of regular pattern to you, and then you put that idea into your head. Now, that's the basis of what's called constructivist learning or constructionist learning. Um, also happens to be a basis for maker education. But the idea is that we create an environment and within that environment, students learn things. And as they learn things, they are the ones that create the knowledge in their head and figure out how it's connected. And, and that's very true. I, mean, they're, they're, I can't think of any condition under which rewiring neurons causes learning. Usually when a surgeon goes in and opens up your head and rearranges things, it gets worse, not better. But if I arrange a learning environment and you decide to learn, you decide to buy into this, idea, where you decide to try this challenge that we put in front of you, then some very rich, deep things begin to happen. And so tools plus mentor plus learner is what we would define as you know, sort of the equation from maker education. And you can't take out the mentor. That's a very, very important piece. Now, the mentor may not sit there and do things for the student. In fact, you think they shouldn't do things for the student. But the mentor is there to, for some very specific things we'll talk about shortly. Now, it's tempting, particularly with 3D printing. I mean, this is an amazing technology. It's very tempting to just put this in front of students and say, that'll solve their problem. Okay? 
If you're a teacher, you know that's not true. If you're not a teacher, good morning, you don't believe it. That doesn't happen, okay? What, what Tom does with his students, he sets a very specific learning environment. He took a lot of time thinking through the process that he uses to bring learning to students. The mentor must spend time setting up a good learning environment. And so don't get caught up in the, the bright and shiny syndrome, okay? You still need a good system. You still need a good teacher, someone who can help the students learn. Now, you can multiply yourself because of the internet, you might be able to come up with great educational content and put it out there, but you are still teaching. You're still being a mentor. You're still giving information in, in a certain way. But when that happens, it tends to be the sage in the stage, still, particularly if you're going to the internet, because that person is the, you know, the amazing, the, um, you know, the uh, fantastic, whoever it is. Um, when I was a kid, it was uh, Mr. Wizard. Um, uh, Bill and I, the science guys, another guy. And these are cool people, you know, and some students will, will look into that and they'll become scientists. But for the average student, they'll say, oh, that's too big, that's too much, I can't do that. And so a clever teacher is then required to set up a less threatening environment where students can go explore on their own and there isn't this stage in the state mentality. And students have the permission to go explore and over the way sometimes be wrong and realize that wrong isn't bad. Wrong is just a roadblock. But a roadblock isn't permanent, right? You can get around it, and good teachers know this. Now it's tempting when a student has a roadblock, it's tempting. Some teachers will go out and they'll just get a big piece of equipment and knock it down. They'll just come in with all of their solutions and knock it down. But did the student learn anything? No, because the teacher did all the work. The thinking must happen in the mind of the student. When, when a good teacher teaches, they leave the student in the driver's seat because the student is not going to learn anywhere else. If the student needs to learn to drive, they've got to be in the driver's seat, which means they're going to bump into things sometimes, okay? particularly in the beginning, they're going to make some mistakes. And, and that is not failing. Make our education, we encourage that. We encourage students to try things. Because sometimes you make mistakes, and that's okay, that's part of life. And you learn from those mistakes and you move forward, and it isn't a mistake. It's the first step toward learning something. Okay? That's a major difference, a major shift in how we think about these things. A good teacher has a love of teaching. But a great teacher has a love of learning. That sounds the same, but it is very different. The philosophy of teaching, which has um, come down to our lecturing systems, is that someone stands in the front, and I'm the font of knowledge, and I dispense my knowledge to you, step by step, some for you, some for you, some for you, and, and I, I give out of the abundance of what I know to you. And so, when you need to know something, what do you do? You come back to me. And I become a pinch point. I become the bottleneck for learning. And I also become the highest bar that you can reach if you put me in that spot. If you want to get past where I am, then you have to become a learner. Now, a good teacher knows how to create learning learners, because they're not intimidated by the idea of continuing to learn themselves. A good teacher is also addicted to learning. They're always trying new stuff, and when they don't know something, they say, wow, I didn't know that. Let's go find out. You can, you can teach things with that philosophy that you don't even know, because you don't have to be the expert anymore. Now, that freaked me out, okay, because I confess, I have a PhD in physics. Sorry, it does separate me from the average person. It does make me the outcast of parties. So I try not to say that. And and as I came through my education, you know, I was someone was expected to be the expert. You went and you asked them. When I started watching my wife teach, I didn't exactly know what was happening because it looked like she wasn't doing anything. 
she would stand at the front and she would give an assignment and the students would just start doing stuff. And it looked kind of random and I did, you know, there, there wasn't like this structured knowledge coming out and I was a little uncomfortable with this. But over time what I realized was she was creating learners. She was creating learners. She wasn't the bottleneck. Because those students were learning things that she didn't even know because they were going elsewhere to learn it themselves. They were becoming what some of the educational field like to call lifelong learners. This is kind of the buzzword out there, lifelong learning. You can call it whatever you want, okay? I'm a maker. I like to think of it as a maker education. We, just, we, we go make things, we try stuff. When it doesn't work, we go see if there's another way to try something. So we're going to come back to this STEM idea. And I, I love it that in the last two sessions, they already talked about this. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. STEAM puts art in this. And STEAM, the A piece that's important, that gives this different reflection on creativity. Now, I, I saw a hand go up in the back of the room. You know what I mean, right? Now, some of you may not be aware of this. I'm a scientist. I've watched scientists for a long time. The best scientists are artists. They really are. Because those amazing nonlinear leaps of thinking, those come from somewhere deep inside, and they can't put a logical progression on how they knew that thing was going to happen. What they do is they make this huge leap, like there's a And then they go back and fill in all the logical steps. Because they know that there must be a logical step. If you're a scientist, you know there's a reason all that happened. But to make the first leap, they didn't wait around for someone to say, okay, it's okay for you to go do that. They just went and did it. There's this creative thing in their head that said, that will work. And they just went out and tried it, and sure enough, and that's that A piece in there, okay? Art occurs in lots of ways, you know, and we're used to seeing galleries and things. But that creative, nonlinear thinking, that idea that when you create something, it should be beautiful, like Steve Jobs talked about, the idea of the Mac and the iPhone, that, that it should look beautiful on the inside just as much as it does on the outside, okay? That's just an artistic way of thinking, and it can happen in technology, and, and, as well as in lots of other places. And so we think that's important. Now, I'm going to blow your mind up. I, I, I heard this from someone recently, so I'm not making this up. I stole this actually from a teacher. She's at a little rural school in North Carolina, and she said, oh, she said, you, you, should, be, you should be teaching East. And, no. <gasps> What's the E? Entrepreneurship. Now, if any, we have any business people out here? Ooh, all right, perfect. I want you to listen because this is really, really important. We don't teach this much in schools, but maker education is a perfect place to introduce entrepreneurship because it's fine to have an idea, it's fine to create something cool, but if you do not know how to go out and turn it into something, you're not helping very many people. Now, you can become an artist and put your art in galleries, okay, and I think that's fantastic. There are some people that need to do that. There are some of us whose art needs to be available to millions of people, maybe just thousands of people, but to more than just me and a few people. And you need to add the E onto this because we're not, we don't just want problem solvers, okay? You hear critical thinking, critical thinking, problem solving, all that. We want to add a word at the beginning of that. We want proactive problem solvers. Now, I stole this from a friend of mine. I didn't make all this up. Okay, I'm smart because a lot of people I know are really smarter than me. And I just take their ideas. And I got this idea from a friend of mine. It matters that we have proactive problem solvers. We don't want someone where a problem just occurs to them and they, you know, it goes over and over and over. And eventually, out of frustration, they just solve the problem. We need people who are going out and saying, oh, that's a problem. I can fix that. Uh, I know the solution to that. Let's try this. We need someone with an entrepreneurial mindset to go out, find problems that are out there and fix them before anyone says, oh, that's a problem. We didn't know we needed an iPhone. How much difference does an iPhone make? Okay, it's, it's in our culture and it's completely changed the way we do lots of things because someone thought, hmm, I wonder... It seems like we should have a computer that's easier to take with us, and, and it's easier to interface with, and it's really intuitive, and, 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 and. And so we need the proactive problem solvers. If you're a manager and you have non-proactive people working for you, 
you have to send babysitters after these people to make them do stuff all the time. That's really, really frustrating. To have they have to babysit these people all the time. If you had people that in your workforce that just solved problems, you didn't have to chase them around. They, they just saw something and said, oh, I can fix it, and just took care of it. In fact, you never even knew their problem happened in the first place because it got taken care of before you even knew it was a problem. How much more effective would your organization be if we could create a generation of a workforce that thought like that? You know, maybe we can't make 100% of them like that, but what if we can make 10% more? What if we can make 15% more? The dramatic improvement in our workforce would revolutionize business. All right, you came here to find out what maker education looks like, and I'm going to try to deliver, right? This is Gabe and Corey, and I wish I had a better picture, but I don't. This is called the happy car. I asked them about the name. I don't know why it's called the happy car. But this is a 3D challenge to make a recycle, a car out of recycled parts by using 3D printing to kind of weld everything together. And so there's the, the outside, which is bling really well, is a, a water bottle. The platform it's on is a, a piece of plywood from someone's yard. And there's some other cast offs. There's a piece of an old broken dryer in there and some other things that they found just lying around. So they started off by thinking up ideas. And Gabe came to me and said, I'm gonna build a bus. I said, okay. And I went, to, I, I went into the next room, and in my head, I was thinking school bus. Okay, that's what I mean, or Greyhound bus, and that was in my head. And I came back, and really, it was five minutes later, I promise you, it was five minutes later, and he had taken SketchUp, which is the tool he's got there in front of him, and he'd drawn a bus, a VW bus. And I was amazed that in five minutes he was able to convey to me the idea that he wanted to make a VW bus with a tool that he had just barely been introduced to. Okay? Some kids pick this up so fast, you will be amazed at their capabilities. And it has nothing to do with age. Some kids just naturally pick up these tools and run with them. Along the way, we have lots of learning opportunities. They find out really quick that 3D printers are amazing and amazingly slow. If you want your parts to come off quick like a microwave, good luck. It's going to be minutes, hours later that your part comes off. Well, if you have a bunch of kids trying to print off one printer, that's bottleneck. And so after a while, you say something like, well, what if you didn't print off the whole thing but just part of it, the part that you needed to check? And then you step out. And that little comment just rolls around in their head for a while and they think, hmm, well, maybe we could just print off this little square piece because maybe that would be enough for us to see that in the bottom, right there, that little square piece there, that they just need to find out if that fits on a switch or not. And they don't have to print all the rest of that. They, and and the, the little test print, you saw three of them, Maybe they change the size of each one so they only have to print one time, three different sizes, and they take the one that worked. Now, if you can get students to think like that instead, would that be valuable? This is a picture of an early, an early version. That happy car did not happen in version one. I already said that before. Version one is usually not that good. I mean, we like, to, you know, we like to believe we're geniuses and it just comes right out of our head and there's these, you know, all these fantastic ideas to just spring off the paper into reality. Not true. What really happened is they started off using a PVC pipe. And you see the gear uh, glued on the PVC pipe there, the little worm gear to drive it. And they found out, they hooked up the motor, and they were almost done. They hooked it up, they were ready to go. This thing was going to be amazing. They turned on the motor and it wouldn't turn. Any idea why? Gearing was wrong. Possibly the gearing was wrong. We could have made it lower gear. Anything else? Not enough power. Not enough power. How much you solve that? If you have, if you can't change the power, and it's difficult to change the gearing, what else can you change? Weight. You can change the weight. Friction. Friction. What might you do? 
You might make smaller bearings. You might... Oh, a bearing. Yeah. Perfect. Yes. And so they went back and they completely redesigned the little white piece there and found bearings in a drawer in someone's garage and, you know, their dad had, had cast off and had a little drawer full of these things. And then when they, you know, lifted four bearings out of the garage and brought them in for the recycle project and get this thing down in the lower left. Um, and in order to do that, the bearing didn't fit a PVC pipe nicely, but it turns out that a copper pipe, a half inch copper pipe, fit right in the middle of that thing, they, they just had to kind of press it on a little bit, it was perfect. And so they redesigned their gears and their bearing holder, and they were back in business. And by the way, they used to apply. Um, which, by the way, if you're interested, you can ask me later about that, I'm not going to go deeply into that. But the wheel, uh, I mean, they, they, there's four or five different versions of the wheel. Now, they did the same thing with the wheel. They print off a couple of test parts to see if it would fit. And then they made uh, three or four different versions of the wheel and then picked the one they, they thought was the coolest. And of course, they had to brand it. So there's a KG Engineering. That's Korean K Engineering. And this is, these are the parts that come off. They did a friction fit on the motor so it didn't have to be glued in. Uh, they did a uh, friction fit from the worm gear onto the motor. There's a little thrust bearing there because it turns out the way that it was pushing it put something on the other side so it didn't pull off. And these are all things they figure out as they went along because they, they first just put the little worm gear on there and it turned out it didn't, didn't work right. So this iterative thinking is what happens in real life. If you're an engineer, you already know this happens. If you've been in a career for a while, you know the first version doesn't, doesn't always work well. You get to rev three, four, five, six, seven, it's starting to work really well. You, you dive this in really quickly. But where else other than maker education will you have this opportunity? You have to be, you have to have an environment where it's okay to try things, to have it not work, and to rework your ideas and try it again. Can someone give me the time? How much? Ooh. All right, we'll fly through this. Uh, we also introduced the Arduino platform, which is a way for kids to, to turn their ideas into a dynamic process. Um, they get to learn soft skills, like how to collaborate and share, and how to present, and how to iterate. Now, I can't pass this slide up without just taking a second. When you send kids away for the weekend and they come back with a welded diamond plate box that's painted black on the inside for optical reasons, and you didn't tell them to go do that, you know those kids learned something, they were excited, and their thinking has changed forever. This way of educating matters, and it doesn't just apply to kids. You're right, it applies to adults too, okay? We happen to be working with kids, but this style of learning, with the experiential learning, is, in my opinion, the best way to learn anything for adults or kids. This is a diagram. We and kids encourage the kids to start off with a, an idea, some sort of uh, boilerplate diagram of some sort to try. And so they have all of their, uh, this is just for a security system. The idea is you have teams, each team has a, an object they have to secure, and they have to have an electronic warning system that warns the uh, security guards if the security is breached. And so each team puts up uh, a security system. Now it turns out that these guys have a little note on the bottom that says there is a cartoon on the back. Here's, here's the art, completely unsolicited. Like this wasn't even part of the project. I gotta know where this came from. And this is this is what happens if someone tries to breach their security. Now, I think this is awesome. I'm not even gonna try to explain that. I mean, I, I, I didn't draw this, but it's obvious that these kids are having a good time, and they're just drawing this for fun on the side because their creative juices are just flowing. And so they take this 
project and they add some sensors to it and some logic and programming into the Arduino a little bit. And this comes out. And their object is in the box. Now I had, they, they somehow, they, I don't know where they, they, they went and found a hotel safe and brought it in. I, where do you get a hotel safe? I don't even know where you get a hotel safe. Okay, but they brought a hotel safe in. Now, I had to tell them that they had to make the assumption that all of their teammates were expert locksmiths and there's no way they could get locked out. And so they had to leave the safe open <laughs> for the project because we put them into teams and each team got the chance to try to circumvent every other team's security. Now, this particular one, just take a guess, how, how many people, if, if there's seven teams, and this, how many, how many teams do you think were able to breach the security on this? Yes? Something between zero and six. Two. Zero. Two, zero. Two. Uh, let's think about it. How many say, how many say, uh, the, the less than three teams. Uh, less than two teams. Less than one team. No teams. 100% intruder rejection. In fact, every single team in this particular project had 100% intruder rejection. And the, the awesome thing is, is one of the teams, their security got breached electronically. But, they had thought creatively, and they made a decoy, and the person who pulled out the object grabbed the decoy. <laughs> I think that is, that's, that's fantastic, okay? Um, I, I, have, I have to hurry up when it finishes. I mean, I could just go all day. I want to come back to this point about, about teachers, okay? We need teachers to understand how to do this. In fact, at some level, it's more important that we teach the teachers than we teach the students right now. The teachers need to know how to be involved with this because teachers are the front line to the students. I can't reach every student, but I can reach a lot more students by reaching teachers. And we're working with students so that we know how to teach teachers to reach students. But we're trying to teach teachers right alongside of working with students because teachers, teachers are the lifeblood of the education system. They really are. Like I said earlier, education does not occur without a good teacher. Teachers help students get past the roadblocks. They set up, they set up those learning environments. And I, I, I promised myself I wouldn't do this, but I can't pass up this slide. Someone mentioned earlier about questions about uh, uh, K-5 middle school. We normally work with teens. That's what we focus on because we're specifically looking for the nonlinear thinking. So we, we targeted teens in what we do. But this is a fourth grade teacher, and we just couldn't say no to him. He just kept coming back, and he wanted to try some of the ideas. And so he's taking this to his fourth grade class. He's amazing. He's got a little bug project that he's done with the kids. And at the end of the slideshow, there's a link to our website that, that goes to this video that one of his kids did. Again, unsolicited, but it is hilarious. It's one of the funniest things I've seen. And when you know that a 10-year-old did it, I mean, it's, it's totally hilarious. You have to go check it out. It's, it's linked in the website at the end of the talk. 3D printed nose cones for rockets. We believe that learning should be fun. It should be exciting. And it should be challenging. We believe that maker education, it, it doesn't see any gender, it doesn't see color, it doesn't see any other kinds of limitations. Everyone can go tinker and try things. Everyone has this capability. The real world requires precision, it gives real feedback, and sometimes it matters how you do things. And the real world will give you that feedback. It will. Your projects won't work if you don't make them right. Okay? And that is good feedback. Because not everything works. However, everyone can figure out how it works by taking a little time. Um, learning is, again, it, it's exciting and it's fun. And it also should breed uh, exceptional um, uh, results. And we believe that it can be fun and provide exceptional results. And we also believe that these kids can come up with creative solutions. It's my daughter right there. Yes, it is. This, uh, this, 
they, this, this is, that, was, that was their split up. If you can get this kind of engagement, okay, I don't have time to tell the story about what's happening here. Those kids are completely engaged in their learning. I mean, completely engaged. And if we can get learning like this, we can revolutionize the education system. Become a maker. Partner with your local school. And create a thriving educational maker spaces. We need maker spaces in schools because kids need to make things. They need to be trying this. There are some specific ways to do that. There are some clever things you can do. You should definitely talk to us about how to do that because there's some ways to leverage your investments. But if if you're a maker, go find a bunch of makers. Get them together. Go start a maker space at your school. If you're a business person, you know, get some business partners. Fund a maker space. Partner with a local school. Put maker spaces in your in, in your local schools. Okay, it's important that you get involved personally. It matters that you get personally involved with this. Okay, get your engineers down there, lend them, you know, lend them your creative uh, designers, etc. They need to be down there working with the students. If you've watched this all the way to the end, let me reiterate a couple of points. You need to get involved in maker education. We believe here at Tabletop Inventing that most of us are makers. Most of us love it when others rave about something we made. We believe maker education is both new and old. The new tools we have give us skills we could never have deployed so broadly even 10 years ago, such as 3D printing and other maker tools. But making is also ancient. As humans, we've always been makers. You could say we were made to make. Come help us start a revolution.